Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Simon Rose of Save Our Savers. A bit like Save the Whales. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe Savers are probably closest to extinction the way things are going. I think so. You know, it's interesting, ecology and finance, uh, they should actually approach finance like ecology because the markets are being intoxicated with toxic bonds and toxic policies. Greenpeace should open a branch on Wall Street. I've been saying that for years. But anyway, Simon, uh, you've brought in a fascinating study here from William F. Ford, ex-president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, produced this report. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, everybody, you know, everybody's been saying that low interest rates are the way to, to produce growth, or at least not everybody, but those people who uh, think the way to uh, get forward is more borrowing. But there, his team actually calculated what would happen if the people who used to get their income still had it. And he said that low interest rates are costing the U.S. economy an annual 371 billion dollars in spending, three and a half million jobs, and 2.53% of GDP. And it says, with higher interest income levels, output could grow more than twice as fast it has, and the US economy would be well on its way to a vigorous recovery. And that's coming from an ex-central banker. This is extremely important, I think, because if interest rates are allowed to remain in a normal level, uh, reflective of the economy uh, without government interference, then people with savings would generate a huge amount of income on their savings, and that income, of course, is you, can be used to spend. Uh, yeah. But that, that spending is not happening because hmm. the interest rates are artificially brought down to near zero percent. Uh, and the idea being that the government was going to ag increase demand somehow yeah. by having cheap rates. Yeah, but which, all yeah which is just ludicrous. The, the trouble is, they're all theoretical economists. They don't seem to understand how real people behave. So we're in a debt crisis, so the people who are heavily indebted are probably not going to be spending that much more. They're going to try and retrench. So the people who had money, the savers, suddenly think, gracious, we've got the governor of the Bank of England saying this is going to go on five more years. We'd better husband our resources. We can get almost nothing on our savings. The instinct is to hang on to your money, even though you're actually losing money through negative real interest rates. It's not to go out and suddenly spend as if there's no tomorrow. It makes absolutely no sense. And that's without talking about, of course, whether the central banks should actually be controlling the price of money anyway. So uh, the arbitrage of interest rates on your savings uh, versus the daily workings of a bank are been working for generations. The, the bank offers savers a rate of interest. It then loans money out at a different rate of interest. And therein lies the spread that they use to create profits for the bank. But since the banks have become involved not with traditional banking, mm. but in speculation, they feed on artificially cheap interest rates yep. to fuel another set of arbitrage, which is the amount of negative interest rates that they can borrow against to fuel speculative bets using derivatives in the hopes of capturing huge gains that they say will eventually trickle down to society at large, but somehow never do. Yeah. Uh, and you've got this enormous hole in economics where the savers who would traditionally perform the role of increasing spending by the fact that they're saving. You know, it's capitalism, right? Capitalism, you need capital. To have capital, you need an interest rate to attract capital. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they don't seem to understand, that savings provide the investment money we need to produce growth. So what do you do in a debt crisis? Well, let's just sit on savers and let's squeeze them till they're really hurt. We talked about six months ago. At that stage, I would have thought interest rates for savers couldn't go any lower. But they are going lower and lower. And now in the UK, the latest idea to help the banks out is this funding for lending scheme, which is giving the banks incredibly cheap money, which in theory they should be lending on. They're probably not going to. And all that's happened is they don't need savers money anymore, so interest rates have gone down still lower. Simon Rose of Save Our Savers, interest rates in Switzerland are negative, negative <laughs> half a percent. There are six countries in Europe where savings rates in those countries are negative. People are, are, are are allowing the banks to take money from them to just hold on at a guaranteed loss. So what we're seeing is the decapitalization of the West. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, eventually, there'll be no savings left, and where are we going to be then? We, you know, they keep arguing in this country about the difference between austerity and growth. They don't seem to understand where, how wealth and growth are created in the first place. The level of knowledge about the economy among the people who are actually deciding what's happening is absolutely asinine. I mean, in the UK, for instance, we've had the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister and even the Chancellor on occasion have got confused over the difference between the deficit and the debt. For the uh, George Osborne occasionally watches this show, 
uh, my understanding, to pick up on some of the things he missed out when he was out there at some uh, piggly wiggly party at Eaton. So uh, tell him what the difference is. <laughs> the, the deficit is simply the amount, the extra amount you're borrowing each year. The debt is the total amount you're owing. And unfortunately, the UK, although the perception is that the government is actually, well, the perception among many people is they're reducing the debt. Not only are they not reducing the debt, the deficit, which was due to come down in this current financial year to about £92 billion, well, the latest projections are it's going to be 120, maybe 130 up on last year. So it's not, not only is the debt not going down, the deficit is going back up. And we're going to be, we currently owe about, as a government, £1 trillion. Pounds. That's due on their forecast, forecast to go up to one and a half trillion in three years. As a percentage of GDP, that represents. Well, that will at the moment we're on about two thirds of GDP. It's going to go up to like America by about three years. It'll be a hundred percent of GDP. Okay. And that's well, not including, of course, all the contingent liabilities that they don't bother to put in the figures. So it's pretty scary. We're in a debt crisis, and the debt is getting worse. Okay. So the government deficit is heading to hundred percent of GDP or yeah. higher. What is the consumer debt to GDP situation? That's similar. It's about hundred percent at the moment. Okay. The what's big, the the biggest problem, of course, is the financial sector. Okay, financial sector debt to GDP. <laughs> it depends who you talk to. Uh, McKinsey figures will show that if you add up all the sectors, which including about 300% in the financial sector, you get to about 500% debt to GDP for all the sectors. Um, but other people, Morgan Stanley worked it out and said it's 10 times GDP. So let's split the difference, say it's seven and a half times. So that's plus eight and a half for the national debt, plus another 100% for uh, private debt. So that's almost 1,000% debt to GDP for the UK at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, what was Iceland before it imploded? I can't remember. It's about a thousand percent debt to GDP. And uh, if, in fact, now this is a policy that's just not, it's not unique to the UK. Every government in the world is pursuing this race to the bottom, yeah. by devaluing its currency, bringing in zero, zero percent interest yeah. rates, this faulty idea that by making uh, debt so cheap that you're carving out the very essence of your economy and destroying your yeah. currency, you're going to somehow stimulate export yeah. growth. It's like, it's like a lot of leaking lifeboats. It's just which lifeboat is actually leaking least. Let's try and jump in that one. It's ridiculous. You say it's a race to the bottom. Right. So you got two lifeboats, both with holes in them, yeah. and with people standing in those boats, bailing out uh, by dumping water from their boat that they're bailing out into the one next to them. Yeah. And yeah. that's going on simultaneously back and forth all over the world, and the whole thing is sinking. Uh, and now, um, the, the apocalypse, the paper apocalypse that's coming, uh, as all of this, uh, and by the way, government bonds, which are really kind of the biggest bubble in the history of the world, with the yeah. U.S. 10-year Treasury note trading at a 240-year high, it's, it's in a bigger bubble than even tulip bulbs in the 16th, you know, 1600s. Uh, with that enormous bubble now ready to burst and the paper apocalypse coming upon us, uh, many suggest that those with the most gold will survive. In, yep. in, in a leper colony, those with the gold teeth do best. I just made that up. But anyway. UK, of course, thanks to Gordon Brown, is not doing well on that front either. <laughs> no, Gordon Brown um, sold our gold. Not just sold a gold at the bottom, but actually announced he was going to be selling the gold before he did so, which, from a trading point of view, is not the smartest thing to do. Though I have seen articles saying that, in fact, he was actually doing it to help out the banks at the time, which had an overextended position. I still don't know if that's true or not. I'm told in some quarters by people who do know about gold that, yeah, that's the real story. He sold half of Britain's gold. Now, Britain has 310 tons of gold, uh, which is not that much more than green versus the Eurozone, which has 12,000 tons of gold. What do you make of this spat between Cameron and the Eurozone? It seems like Cameron is sticking his foot in his mouth because if, in fact, there's a split and the monetary banking union stays in Eurozone and the UK is isolated, mm. the UK stands to lose because they have this huge debt burden. Who's there to fund the debt? You're going to go to the European partners well, and fund all well, this debt? Well, in, most, in most of the arguments about the EU, it's all about, oh, we trade so much with the EU, we need to be in the EU. Of course, the most important thing is how extended our banks are to what's going on in Europe. I right. mean, if, if, you know, if the euro goes down, I'm sure it will have an appalling effect in this country, too. But who's going to fund this 1,000% GDP ratio? This is the worst indebtedness of any of the yeah. G20 countries. It, appalling. But you've got this idea among uh, many economists that debt just simply doesn't matter. For every debtor, there's a creditor. Therefore, we can just ignore it completely. I don't believe that for a minute. I don't think most savers believe it. The problem is we're getting into a really terrible position. And they've stalemated themselves. They've painted themselves into a corner. What is the natural way out now? It's, I mean, it's almost all the options are appalling to think of. Almost the best bad option is just stagnation. But isn't, my point though, isn't Cameron painting himself into a corner? Because if they bring in a fiscal union, which it looks like they will, mm. that's an enormous 
piece of business that's not going to be run through Frankfurt and to manage this um, huge new lending facility, new central banking facility. It'll be in euros. Mm. It won't be in British pounds. The Britain will have isolated itself from this business. And the banking center, which Britain prides itself on, is going to be diluted. Not, not, not only do they have the scandals of HSBC, which has just announced another half a, a billion dollars worth of money laundering charges tied to Mexican drug cartels mm. to bring that total in liability, uh, you know, 50 or 60 percent beyond what it was even two weeks ago. But, uh, and not only LIBOR goes to London. Not only does London have this reputation for AIG, Bernie Madoff, uh, the MF Global scandal. Yeah, we're world leaders. In scandal. Okay, <laughs> so now, so as the, as capital requirements are increased, as people are attacking the UK as a banking fraud nexus, and as the euro is taking the business over to the continent, and but how can Cameron argue that, you know, with a straight face to the population, that he won't let, he won't be dictated to by those European bureaucrats? Isn't he just blowing how, how his own argue, brains out? How can he argue with a straight face? Because he's a politician. All he's concerned about is the next election. That, and that's part of the problem. We're getting short-termist politicians running everything, when what we need are people who actually are thinking for the long term and working out how to get, get out of the crisis. Like most politicians, by the time it really hits, the chances are he'll be off doing speeches at minimum million pounds a time, as many of our ex-premiers are doing. Now, there's been some dissension in the ranks, Simon Rose, of Save Our Savers. Uh, Mervyn King, of course, Bank of England, outgoing Bank of mm. England head, he's been really uh, pointing the finger and saying that the policies of quantitative easing really are, uh, at best, a Band-Aid situation that fixes nothing. Uh, and he's really, I think, trying to bring some reality into the mix. Strange, isn't it? Now that he's retiring, suddenly we're hearing words of wisdom from him. Um, though he still never admitted that the MPCs had anything to do with the situation we're in. No, Mervyn King is saying reasonably sensible things, even, even um, Charlie Bean saying reasonably sensible things. The most sensible thing I've heard from the Bank of England, though, because who actually admitted in a report that the real effect of QE was to transfer money from the poorest in society to the wealthiest is from uh, Spencer Dale, the chief economist, who said, surely one lesson we've learned from the financial crisis is that economists and policymakers know less about the economy and its behavior than many might have liked to believe. We don't fully understand the structure of the economy or the behavior of households and companies within it. Not even close. And he concluded, is there a danger we might do more harm than good? I think we know how to answer that. Right. The answer for a complicated system seems to make it more complicated. Complicated, yeah, yeah. Which is, of course, one of the corollaries of the definition of insanity. Yeah. So they're just admitting that nothing they can do. It's too complicated for them to do anything. We've got to do something anyway. And of course, what they've done are the wrong things. All right, Simon Rose of Save Our Savers. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Simon Rose of Save Our Savers. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.